Hi, everybody, and welcome to the monthly live chat with Lynn Acton. And today we will be talking about behaviors that might not mean what we think they mean. And Lynn is getting connected to her audio. She'll be joining us shortly. If you have questions as we go along, drop them in the chat. We'll be monitoring that. We may not have answers, but it might add to the conversation. So definitely feel free to drop them in there. I'm really glad that this topic came up and I don't remember whether it was Lynn or I that came up with this topic. Certainly something I grapple with on a daily basis is trying to accurately interpret horses behaviors. So hi, Lynn, it sounds like your audio is- Hello. Oh, good. Everything you are good. good. Okay, great. <laughs> so it's kind of introducing the topic on, on interpreting behaviors, how they might not mean what we think they mean. and. I was wondering, Lynn, if you could start us off on giving us your ideas about why it can be complex to interpret horse behaviors and maybe some of the ways many of us get led to being inaccurate in, in our interpretations. Yes. Uh, when, when we look at a horse's behavior, there's a number of dimensions to it. We need to look at its body language, but also consider the context because um, it, many behaviors can mean multiple things. So we need to know the context. Uh, we need to try and figure out the emotion that's behind the behavior because that's a, a huge piece of it. And as best we might know the history of the horse and how that factors in and your intuition. Intuition is hugely important. If I look at a horse, I'm, I ask myself something like, um, if he were speaking English, what would he be saying to me right now? And I find that people tend to be really um, good at interpreting horse's behavior if they follow their intuition, especially if they know their horse. In fact, a, um, a study showed that empathetic horse owners were actually better at interpreting their horse's behavior than professionals were, hmm. which is uh, rather intriguing. But an awful lot of people get misled by authority figures, especially trainers who get focused too much on obedience and not enough on looking at what's behind the horse's behavior. It becomes a binary. Is he doing what I told him to or is he not? And then there's no questioning of why is there an issue here? So um, and then people can get misled, you know, like, well, if he's rearing, it must be aggression. No, rearing can be play, aggression, um, or, or fear. And I think, uh, Jack, you'll know the answer to this one. Can it be pain? Can, can pain cause a horse to rear? Well, I have a, you know, on this, on this note uh, here, staying with this for a minute, I have a brief story followed by a question, Liz. I'm interested in your opinion on this. So I was reflecting today on being a, a young trainer. When I first moved to California, I was sharing a barn with a few other trainers who I really looked up to. They were older than me. They were more experienced. And one day the local dressage trainer was riding her horse and it was her own horse. And I mean, the horse was frankly just acting like a total butthead. I mean, it was just like, it was not a horse I would want to ride in that moment. I mean, it was pretty naughty, we could say. And I remember she just kind of laughed and she looked at me and she's like, you know, I, I was, she'd been out of town for a few days. She goes, Oh, he's telling me he doesn't like it when I leave town. You know, he's, he, he's feeling like I neglected him and this is his way of telling me. And I remember being young and impressionable and thinking, is that really what he's telling her? Cause it kind of just looks like he's being fresh and spunky to me. But I wonder my question, Lynn is, do you think sometimes our tendency to kind of anthropomorphize? I, I think I saw that as a case of, wow, we're really anthropomorphizing what this horse might feel, that that the horse even knew she was traveling or, you know, whatever. Do you think that sometimes that gets, that that clouds our ability to be accurate in interpreting their behaviors? Oh, yes. I think that that's a huge issue. Um, I have an impression, though, that when people have a negative interpretation of the behavior, that's more likely to be anthropomorphism. It's like, oh, he's being a butthead. She's being a, you know what, um, he's being a jerk. Anything that's negative 
usually, it, and it's not specific then, you know, why would the horse be doing whatever they're doing and it's not describing the behavior? Um, but then that's when people seem to be taking it personally, mm. as if the horse has it in for them in some way. And that I think is anthropomorphizing it as if the horse had, is for no particular reason, just being, being a jerk and thwarting your plans. Mm. Um, as for the your your story about the instructor out of town, that's a it's a really intriguing one, and it could very well have been her projection, or it could have been. Uh, I noticed very much with Bronze the when he was younger, he reacted very much to my going away. When I came back, he would be a real crab, and there I go saying you know saying nasty things about my horse, but he would be less engaged, and my husband's horse and the opposite, she would knock herself out to please us for the first few days after we got back. So I, I have definitely seen horses react to an owner's absence. No question about that. Which one it is, it can be really hard to tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, I didn't know if you wanted to carry, before I interrupted you, if you wanted to carry on with uh, considering sort of the context and the body language as we try to unravel what the horses are telling us in any given moment on any given day. Well, I had um, I had a picture of Brandy rearing on my uh, Facebook page when I introduced this and it sort of let, let people surmise why she was rearing. Is it pain? Is it aggression? Is it... So, um, so if it's okay, I'm going to try screen share here and see if I can get that picture of yeah, Brandy. You should be all clear to do that. I checked the settings. So, right. Okay. And now does, is that showing, is Brandy's picture showing up on the screen? It hasn't showed up yet. Uh oh. Okay. Nothing there. Not yet. Okay. Then I think I've got a screen agreement issue here. Okay. Well, then maybe. Um, oh, here we go. I think something's happening. That's it. Oh, that's <laughs> it. I had to click share. Imagine that. Um, okay, but now so, we can't see your picture. Where's the picture? Oh, you can't see the picture? I see your screen, I think, but I see your browser. Oh, good heavens. <laughs> Oh, how about oh, that? There it, is. there it is. Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. All right. So, so here we are. And how do we decide whether she's rearing out of fear, aggression, um, or or play? Well, if we look at her body language, um, her ears are not pinned. They're sort of radared around, like she's paying attention to what's going on around her. And if you look at her right hind leg, she is pivoting on that hind leg away from me. If she, if this were aggression, she would be wanting to aim right at me. And I'm confident that it's not fear because she already knows me. She's comfortable with me. And this happened in the context of a play session where we were, we were playing at Liberty and she got, it was a, a breezy day and she got overly exuberant and she just got so excited she couldn't stand herself. And so this is, this, this is an example of play, but it's also rearing is an example of, um, um, of a behavior that could be interpreted a number of different ways. And if it's a misinterpreted, if for instance, I assumed that, that was aggression and got on her case about it or, or corrected her for it, I could create fear where it isn't already there. That's a good point, yeah. Well, you know what I see, so that's a cool picture. Thanks for sharing that. And listeners that are tuning in, we're going to put include a link to Lynn's article she wrote about this, which also has that picture and a few others as well. So, you know, looking at her face in that one, so maybe we could talk about facial expressions for a bit, because we're talking about body language of the horse and so facial expressions are one. So her face seemed pretty soft to me there. She wasn't tight around the corner of the eye or the lips or things I typically equate with aggression. Um, and, and facial expressions are interesting. So maybe we could just explore this for a second because they certainly come, well, I should say like facial and head expressions come up a lot during my training when a client will be uh, maybe concerned that a particular exercise might be too challenging or too hard for their horse, like a conditioning kind of exercise. 
And this can be really complex to unwind because a lot of us filter our perception on whether something is physically challenging for the horse through what we consider physically challenging. So I find that my super athletic students have a very different filter than my more, you know, desk jockey clients. And I make that point because when you're trying to condition your horse, let's say he has some movement aberration or he's had some rain lameness or something you're trying to help physically overcome and you, you, you give him an exercise. Sometimes when you first do the exercise, there might be like the horse might respond in some way, like a little head shake or some, some sensory experience that's manifested in their face. Maybe they move their lip around a lot on the bit or these kinds of things. And sometimes students are quick to interpret that. Uh, sometimes accurately, sometimes not, you know, but sometimes those little head movements or lip movements, um, yawning, snorting, this kind of thing, they will say, oh, he's really anxious, or I think she's getting stressed. And they might be getting stressed. We want to choose the right exercises for the horse, but sometimes it's just a quick little thing. And then the face is really calm and the eye looks serene to me. And I'll say, no, 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 let's carry on. Let's see where this goes. But can we talk a little bit about facial expressions, mouth, head movements, this sort of uh, engagement with the horse? Well, there's there's been studies done of horses' ability to make facial expressions, and they have um, more muscles for facial expression than almost any other mammal. So they do have a huge range of facial expressions. Um, and horses read our facial expressions in a very subtle way, which is really intriguing. I and mean, they, they know that smiling is good. We don't even have to be laughing out loud. They know a smile is a good thing. Uh, but reading a horse's facial expression seems to be a lot more difficult for most of us. And I'll admit, I have a hard time with it. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be hearing you describing some specifics of what you look for in facial expression. But yeah, it's really important. Um, along with the rest of the body language. And I know you've included a link in your article on um, snorting or horses kind of blowing out through their nose and all the different things that might mean. It's an interesting, I, I explored that a little bit today when you sent me the link and it's it's an interesting rabbit hole to go down and spend some time on. Because <laughs> there is different qualities to them snorting, right? Like generally, I feel like when a horse is deeply breathing and they release and that nice like blow out through their lips. I consider that generally a very good sign, but certainly there's times where a horse is getting really amped up and they do that short, tight exhalation of air, which has a totally different sound and quality to it. And usually I equate that with tension because usually the horse is giving me other examples of tension in that same moment, you know, but so you know, breathing out and snorting is its own, maybe, you know, um, body language, if you will. There's like so much there we could talk about too. <clears throat> Yes. Uh, I, I, when I looked up, um, you know, when I did a, a search online on what does snorting mean, the interesting thing was there were about four different articles who each said something different, but none of them said it can mean all these different things. And this is where we can get led astray. If you look at one article on snorting, it'll tell you it means horses are happy. Another article means it says that horses are, are stressed. Another article says they need be something else. So you, we have to take into account the other aspects of it, as you said, of um, what else is going on in the situation. But that's an, another example of something that can mean a whole lot more different things, not just one. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I was going to, I know you're going to give us some tips on how to maybe approach how we interpret our horse's behavior and, and helping sort of keep things in context, if you will. So I don't know if you want to start that now or if you had another photo you wanted to share for us to look at and talk about a specific example of um, behavior that could be misinterpreted, perhaps. Because I think my 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 interest in this is we can always, you know, don't beat yourself up if in you know you've misinterpreted something in the past. There's there's always a chance them to get better and to listen better and respond better. At least that's how I stay optimistic about things. Otherwise, we'd get all down on ourselves, right? <laughs> but I think a lot of times it does take pausing and asking myself, um, and is this like my first guess about you know interpreting this behavior? Or do I really think this is the most accurate? You know, am I just sort of 
going through my normal motions. It's interesting that you said, uh, considering the horse's story is a big, in your opinion, is, is something that's important, like their history. I think that can be important, but you know, what's interesting is sometimes when people bring me a horse for training, they tell me his whole story. Sometimes I think that negatively affects my way of working with the horse. Cause I have all these preconceptions. Sometimes I almost need a cleaner slate to, to just see the horse for what it is. Cause otherwise I have this background reel in my mind, but I don't know. That might be contrary to, to how, how it plays out for you. Lynn. No, I, I think that's, that's a really good point. Um, I think different people work, work that differently. I feel like I, I usually kind of want to have some background on the horse because I kind of want to know what I'm up against if there's going to be any any potentially unsafe behavior. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think we have to be careful not to pigeonhole a horse into a preconceived idea based on what we've heard about his background. And certainly if there's a lot negative. Um, a, a friend of ours a few months ago bought a horse whose history was the uh, owner took her to three different trainers and all of the trainers said she was dangerous and ultimately said she should be put down. Um, I looked at the videos and um, none of the trainers were competent and the horse never in the videos did anything that looked anything other than patient and tolerant. Mm -hmm. And four months later, this horse is doing very nicely. So mm -hmm. had somebody taken that history into account too seriously, um, they'd have written the horse off. Yeah. So I think it is important, as, as you said, to make sure that we don't let that um, have too big an impact on how we interact with the horse. What that history told me was that that horse has been through a heck of a lot and was going to need a lot of patient engagement with her new owner in order to trust. Yeah. Wow. I like stories like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. it's it's uh, And, and it's a be beautiful horse and she's working out really well. Uh, but um, yeah. So just to kind of lead us through ways to be, to approach this to, I mean, not that there's a system necessarily, but I know you have some suggestions in your article. And, you know, I was thinking of a simple one today to go back to the head shaking. I was just thinking of an example of the different ways that could be interpreted. So, so sometimes, um, you know, when you're riding a horse, they'll kind of shake their head. Sometimes it certainly is. I've seen it, I think, done out of agitation. Like maybe the rider's really unclear with their cue and the horse has just reached a real frustration point and the, so they'll just kind of shake their head. <clears throat> I've seen that. But I also knew a horse several years ago that after a battery of tests turned out he had actually had an allergy to the sun. And here we are in California. So when he was ridden during the wow. outside, it caused him just to shake his head madly, you know, so that was a physical thing. And certainly I've known some that have had like cysts in their, in their sinus cavities, uh, that flare up or allergies that can cause them to shake their head. But sometimes it is like an emotional expression. So that was just one example I thought of, of it can be very complex sometimes to accurately say, like, I don't, I like people to consider it could be discomfort, but I don't like them to mm -hmm. immediately jump there and think like, oh my God, something's definitely wrong with my heart. Like, I don't, I don't like that to be the first thing necessarily, because it could just be that you're dilute, you're, you, you've overwhelmed him with cues, you know, in your riding, or you're riding him during, you know, mealtime and his buddies are over there and he's a little frustrated, you know, it, it, it's complex. So how do we, um, how do we keep all this in perspective? Well, to, um, uh, to add to your head shaking example, my husband's first mare, had a very, very strong opinion that she did not want any pressure on her bit. And it was, it was very simple. Hold the reins too tight and the head got, the head got shook and then, and then things went downhill from there. Keep the reins really light. And she was an absolute joy to ride. So yeah, I think it, we need to look at all aspects of it. So when a behavior first shows up, I think what we need to do is like go through a whole sort of problem solving list in our mind of um, what's going on in this moment. Did you just try a new bit? Did you just put on a new sap? Does the horse have a new rider? You know, if there's any changes, that's a good thing to look at. Um, we always want to make sure we can rule out pain, but it doesn't mean the vet has to be the first person we call. We might step through other options first, um, you know, try a different bit, um, you know, 
see what uh, see what all of the possibilities might be, and then then look at which what kind of try and narrow it down to which ones are the most likely ones in that moment. Um, I'm sorry. So then you asked me a question, and oh. where were we going with this? <laughs> Oh no! So we we're talking about how we should how we can work to become more accurate in interpreting our horse's behavior. So, one as you're recommending is for sure consider the horse's lifestyle routine. I think of the things you just listed off is like what might be different that's causing this particular um, if it's a new behavior that cropped up. Like let's consider their the context of his daily life, um, and then right. once you've kind of scanned through that. <clears throat> Then I think, um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think your recommendation then was to consider the the context of the moment that you're in. Is that right? Like if you're teaching a new skill or there's social issues, that sort of thing. Yes. Or have you trailered into a new place and maybe something scary happened in route and now he's acting uh, very differently than you anticipated? Yeah. So, um, I wanted to ask your your opinion here, Lynn. This might be a side alley, but I know in your article you reference behaviors that horses will do, like attention seeking behaviors. And that one's interesting to me. So the reason it's interesting to me is because I had written to you about a couple of behaviors I see, I won't say commonly, but I would say not infrequently, <clears throat> that I consider, I'll put them in the mildly annoying column perfectly frank. They're usually behaviors I see the horse is demonstrating either out of confusion or out of a desire to get some sort of a cookie reward. And so things like people who have taught their horse Spanish, this is a big peeve of mine. They've taught their horse Spanish walk, but they've done it in such a sort of um, using a lot of treats and maybe with such an unclear or variety of cues that the horse will frequently just punch its leg out when it's at the mounting stool or when it's at the grooming. Oh. Have you, have you seen this? Or just throws that front oh. leg out. And then... <laughs> I, I was, I was playing with Spanish walk with bronze and one day he was overly enthusiastic and I got kicked in the shins because I was in the wrong position. <laughs> so instituted a new rule. Okay. He's only allowed to do it if I am holding my dressage whip. So you got clear if about I'm not holding you got clear about it. You aren't allowed to do so, but you're right. If you have, if you've taught a behavior that's potentially downright dangerous, and there needs to be a real clear message about when you're being asked to do the behavior or when you're allowed to do the behavior. And uh, similarly irritating are things like horses who want to come up and mug you, or horses who are very mouthy. Yes. And uh, you know they want to have their mouth on your clothing all the time. They want to pick everything up. Um. And one of the, the fun things you can do with that is just teach them to pick up approved things on cue or offer them things to pick up, but, you know, re redirect that behavior so that it's not, um, not and, and I think it sometimes can be a horse trying to engage with you. And, and this is something I see people misinterpret. Horses, um, you know, if a horse feels comfortable with you, if he trusts you, he's going to bond with you. And he may want to have some body contact. He may want to engage with you in games. And um, and if that's mis misunderstood and the horse is pushed away, then his feelings are hurt. He doesn't understand why. And, and you can interfere with a good, good, con uh, good relationship that you've got going. So there need to be some clarity. Um, like, yes, it's okay to nuzzle me, but your teeth aren't supposed to be on my shirt. Kind of thing. So you, you need to set those set those limits. But it's interpreting that behavior in the first place. Why is he doing that? Well, if it's a nuzzle, that to me sounds like mutual grooming. That's a big compliment. We don't want we don't want to give the horse a punitive response to that. If he's trying to put his face in my pocket and grab a treat, that's something else that uh, just says that I haven't been clear enough with him about what the rules are about waiting for treats to be served instead of helping himself. I think what you said just now is so simple, but yet it's very important. So I wanna underline it. Cause I I think even that distinction you gave with the example of a horse kind of like muzzle, especially a young horse, you know, they're chewing on your shirt or they're chewing on the lead line and, and they could be a little mouthy. 
I commonly will hear the response. I'm sure I've been guilty of it in the past of saying, oh, he's trying to get my attention or a horse that's um, sometimes when they're at the cross ties or they're tied up and you're, you're grooming them and they just start pawing like crazy. And I'll hear the owner say, oh, they're trying to get our attention. So what do you mean when you say that? Do, by attention, do you mean they're, to use your example, do you mean that they want a mutual groom or is it they want a cookie shoved in their mouth or that they want to go back out in the field with their pals or, you know, like, what do you mean when you say he wants our attention? Because just as you were talking, I realized that's a really wide open idea. Our attention in what way we can hold space with them and not be touching each other and he can have our attention or we can groom, have our, you know, there's, or he could just be looking for a tree. There's a whole bunch of things that could mean. So I think just getting clear on what we mean when we're like always trying to get my attention when he's pawing or chewing the lean rope or just sort of, you know, dancing around or whatever the behavior might be. So thank you. Yes. I, I think it, it, it's much more constructive if we can establish what's the reason behind that behavior. And sometimes it takes experimenting. So maybe you go and stand with him and then see, is he willing to hang out with you without, you know, if, if you're there with him, is that good enough? Is that what he's really been asking for? Or does the mouth then go in your pocket? Um, if he's pawing, maybe that's an impatience with being left in cross ties and he's not really comfortable being confined or having to stand in one place for that long or, you know, there's a, a whole lot of other reasons, you know, and pawing to me kind of says impatience. And maybe if you come over and stand with him, that then he stops because he feels safer and more comfortable with you standing right next to him while he's stuck there in the cross ties. Yeah. Yeah. Those are all great, great tips. Really great tips. The example too is you gave of standing closer, you know, that's one I've changed my thinking on a lot lately in the last few years. Um, instead of they're crowding me, they're being in my personal space. It's, you know, them seeking safety. Um, I, I do try to direct it so they're not running me over and then, you know, working with them to help them become more confident. But that's definitely one I've changed my tune on a little bit. I continue to evolve on it. Yeah, I think that's a, a really important issue. And I think a lot of people intuitively um, understand where horses are coming from on that. Um, but common training advice often is, well, if he's in your space, he's being rude. And I don't, uh, with you, I'm with you, I don't, I don't agree with that. Um, it depends how he's in my space. When a horse comes into my space gently, quietly, and is not shoving me around, then I take that as he's comfortable being with me. If he's barging into me and bumping me, then chances are he needs to learn better manners before he comes into my space. So it's a matter of the manners, not um, not where, not physically where he is, but how he's behaving in that moment. And then the other one, and this is the, the, the biggest left-handed compliment ever, is if a, when a horse is scared and he wants to crowd against you, like a foal is crowding, leaning against mama for reassurance. And who wants 1,200 pounds leaning against you for, <laughs> for reassurance? So, <laughs> So that's where okay, that comes back to what you said about building their confidence so they don't need to lean on you and they will trust that you can be there with them while they're still safely out of your immediate space. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I, oh, go ahead, go ahead. You, you, so we were, we were talking about what, um, you know, how can people get better at interpreting their horse's behavior and I think one of the most important things is to look at it from a position of empathy rather than thinking about obedience. Instead of saying, he's not doing what I want, you're, you should be asking, why is he doing what he's doing? What's he trying to tell me? What's he feeling? Um, and I'm always watching that. To me, this is just fascination. So as much as you can be curious about your horse's behavior and kind of keep his behavior, keep his emotions on your radar at all times, then you have some comparison and you, and um, it, it helps understand what, um, where he's coming from and notice when the emotions change. Yeah. You, uh, in your, 
article that we'll link to for listeners. It'll be in the notes down below this video. You had reference to the necessity of helping horses find balance in their body. And I wanted to spend just a moment talking about that because I am such a huge believer in that. I see horses become less spooky and reactive. They become more confident. They become friendlier when they are helped to balance. So I think any body out of balance, horse or human, creates anxiety, tension. You know, we go inward instead of outward. I think it's huge. Uh, yes, I think, um, and Susan Harris told me a while back that balance is one of the um, most overlooked causes of behavior problems. Um, in, in her book on horse gates, balance and movement, she says that when horses are off balance, their intuitive reaction is either to speed up or buck. And how often do people say, my horse won't slow down, he's always speeding up, or my horse is bucking for no reason? No, uh, the horse feels that lack of balance long before we do. It's not like a bicycle, it's gonna tip over if we're off balance. And then we, no, most, most riders are not fully in balance anyway. So as soon as the rider's at all off balance, the horse has to compensate. So any of those balance issues a horse might have, it's even worse. Yeah. So I think that's a really important one. And then balance problems lead to, to pain, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I see that a lot on um, what you just described, like, especially when people are trying to canter with their horse on a circle and because of the necessity of the horse needs to stabilize the outside of its body when it's on this arc and it's moving in the asymmetrical fashion of canter, if they don't have the coordination or the balance to do it, to your point, they start going faster. Sometimes that causes some worry and then the rider gets more out of balance. It's commonly when they'll kind mm -hmm. of buck and hop and end up cross cantering behind um, or getting bulky about the canter. Like I see that issue come up a lot, that balance issue that then results in unsavory outcomes, <laughs> uh, mostly owing to just the horse's body being out of balance. They're not being naughty or bad or anything else. And it's almost too simple to believe sometimes we want to think maybe it's something else going on we have to do the hard work of helping them find their balance and us becoming better writers it's a constant journey yes and and and, and on the same um topic of the balance issue uh, there's some training systems that encourage horses to travel on their forehand um you know if, if you're training to have the head way down and the horse is on the forehand, and then you try to jump, what happens? The horse is not balanced for jumping, and so he either refuses or he compensates by rushing, and then the rider is upset with the horse, or um, horses often refuse jumps because the rider's off balance, and the horse is like, I can't get over the jump when you're interfering with my balance, or I'm taking care of you. I'm not going over this jump because I know that if I do, you're not gonna be on my back when we when we land on the other side. Yeah. I, I think people often underestimate how often a horse is taking care of them. That's um, the, and I mean, school horses do this all the time. They have to sort out extraneous cues. So all kinds of different wiggles and, and shifts and bumps. And they have to figure out, am I supposed to be walking, trotting, stopping, whatever? Um, and they figure that out very often. That's what makes a good school horse. But I think a lot of other horses do that too. And, and you know, somebody will ask something like, well, um, I can't get my horse to canter with my six-year-old. Uh, hello, say thank you to your horse because <laughs> she's looking out for your kid, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know they're so generous. And uh, I have a young horse right now in training who reminds me of that, just their generous spirit. They're just a wide open book at that in those early years with what they let us do to their body. Um, I mean, I hope I'm helping him find balance. That's the goal. But in the meantime, he has physical sensations and, and I'm sure a level of trust and all of that that has to come into play to move well and use his body well. Um, let's see, the clock is ticking down. We have five minutes left. So I want to make sure we hit most of the points we, we wanted to hit. Is there anything on your list there in front of you? Oh my gosh, my list could take us on all afternoon, all evening. So um, let's, 
that I think to, to the main point is how do people um, interpret their horse's body language? And, and I think a lot of that is trust your intuition. Um, if you, you know your horse probably better than anybody else does. And uh, if and if somebody else is supposed to be helping you interpret, um, if their view is that there's something wrong with your horse, that your horse is being mean, uh, a lot of negative things about the horse, then I would I would not have a lot of faith in that interpretation. An interpretation that's empathetic is usually more on target, going to get you someplace more uh, constructive. Now, you had mentioned that there's a number of behaviors that indicate pain, that people don't recognize our pain. Um, can you give us a few of those? Well, again, and it's, you know, things I see commonly and they're things that sort of crop up out of nowhere. I'm putting air quotes on that because if you start to track their patterns, I'll, you know, you'll, you'll, you can usually pin them down. But like for one is, um, let's say normally you tie your horse up to tack them up no, nothing happens. But suddenly one week when you tack him up, he starts like really chewing on the, on the lead rope, not mouthing it like a young horse, but like, um, I forget that there's a specific term for it, but really setting his teeth in the rope. Sometimes that can be like gastric distress. Uh, actually, a lot of times it can be gastric distress. Um, mm -hmm. and when that clears up, oh, Hey, the behavior goes away. Um, so sometimes when things like that show up, I take note, I don't panic, but I take note because I'm like, okay, this is definitely out of the ordinary for this horse. He's not trying to be cute. It, it doesn't seem like he's seeking attention from me. What is this about? So that's a common one. Another really common one I see is when horses become uncomfortable in their feet, whether there's like a mild laminitis or you changed shoers or you've done some fancy fandangle thing with their shoeing. When they start seeking a soft spot in their pen or or stall to lower their toe in the back feet and to raise their heel up, like they'll they'll find a high pile of shaving so they can, you know, lift their heel in the back. And when they start standing that way routinely, I start making a note, like throughout the day I watch them. Okay, this is starting to happen a lot more. And I know that that's either something going on in their hind end, maybe like a sacroiliac discomfort and or there's a problem in their feet. They're not balanced maybe they're getting too much sugar in their diet, that sort of thing. So when they raise the back end up on their own, those are two common things I see. Um, in addition to, as I mentioned, horses that have been taught Spanish walk and, or like to count with their front feet, which then turns into pawing. And it's been sort of an erratic. So I like how you got clearer on your cue, Lynn, because a lot of people don't take that step. And like yourself, I have been in front of these horses who just throw their front leg out and they just nail you with their hoof and it can, it can really hurt and there's no well, yeah. like a horse that has learned it clearly they don't do that like they wait for the cue the moment right they don't just randomly throw their front legs out so <laughs> no except that that sometimes when a horse is first learning something especially if they're learning with positive reinforcement they'll often volunteer it <laughs> until they get real confident about it and, and learn to wait for the cue wow. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, th there's a, the other thing to look for is, some, a be is a behavior that looks like something bad but isn't. My husband's mare, when she has gunky stuff on her udder, gets very irritated and she picks up her hind leg to show me where she wants me to take care of her. But the hind leg is coming up and looking like she's getting ready to cow kick. Yeah. And it took me years to realize this wasn't her trying to cow kick or, or threatening me. This was trying to point as best she could to the body part that was uncomfortable and she wanted me to, to help her with. So that was a, a place where the I thought the interpretation of her, her behavior was very clear. I was scolding her for picking her hind foot up. And it took me a long time to figure out she's just trying to point to the body part that needs help. I love it. I love it. And before Zoom, Times us out. There was one other behavior and you referenced it in your article. I think a lot of times it is tied to pain is um, laziness. I don't believe horses are, you know, naturally lazy. I, they're incredible athletes. Um, and when a horse is shuffling around, 
I always try to figure out what is going on here because fitness is protective. Helping a horse become fit in their body always results in more energy and lightness of movement, enthusiasm. So if we can't give fitness to the horse, like what is going wrong? That's not a, that's not a narrative that's normal. It's like, oh, this horse is just so lazy. They're shuffling around, causing a lot of dust. And I know you referenced that as well. So definitely read Lynn's article. We'll link 